My older brother, Shane, had spent the last 10 years in prison, and it looked like he might be in there for the rest of his life. However, he called me recently to say that they were opening up a new early release program, and they would let him out immediately on a probationary period if he agreed to participate. Some sort of new process, an ethical alteration to prevent future criminal activity. God, how I wish now that he had just told them no. Growing up, Shane was my hero. My mom has had a rough life. She got pregnant with Shane when she was 16 and her parents kicked her out of the house for it. Afterwards, she went to live with Shane's father, who was in his early 20s and had a small apartment in the worst part of the city. And he treated her terribly, forcing her to drop out of school and get several jobs so he could spend the majority of his time drinking and partying, hitting her whenever she stepped out of line. But she was terrified of raising a baby alone. She tried her best to make it work with him, but it just wasn't enough. When she started showing, he realized that he didn't want to be a dad and kicked her out too. Faced with the prospect of living on the streets, she lied about her age and managed to secure a lease from a landlord in a nearby building that preferred not to ask questions as long as she paid the rent. When Shane was born, she did her best. As she was only 17 and without an education beyond the 10th grade, she continued to work multiple minimum wage jobs and didn't have much time to spend with her new son. Until he was around six, Shane mostly stayed with an older widow, Roberta, that lived across the hall from them and was sympathetic to their situation. Then, Roberta died, and Mom decided that Shane was old enough to just stay at home alone while she was working, or increasingly, staying out late with her friends or on dates. Mom fell hard into drugs and drinking to cope with the situation, and took comfort in the worst men. None of them ever stuck around for more than a few months, but even still, many of them left their mark on my mother and on Shane. Coming of age in this environment of loneliness, poverty and violence, Shane was a troubled child. He was constantly in detention at school, getting in fights with other kids, stealing, and generally raising hell around the neighborhood. That is, until I came along. One of mom's short-lived flings resulted in a second pregnancy, another boy, and I was born a little over two months after Shane's 12th birthday. Seeing that she wasn't going to change her ways overnight and become mother of the year, he took it upon himself to be my primary parental figure. He changed my diapers, did the weekly shopping, fed me, bathed me, cooked, cleaned. He did everything that he could to make my childhood better than his had been. It became his mission in life to be the father that neither of us had ever had. At school, he opened up a little bootleg shop out of his locker where he'd sell candy, trading cards, snacks, and once he was in high school, cigarettes and liquor just to make a little extra money to buy me clothes and toys. And then, when he turned 16, he took a job at a local auto shop, working on cars in the evening after classes to help pay the rent and our other bills. I never understood where he found the energy to do it all. It was around this time that I started school myself. He packed my lunch every day, and made sure that I got on the bus in the morning. With his supplemental income, Mom was able to quit one of her jobs to be home to get me off the bus at the end of the day and to make dinner at night. Now, I'm not sure if he said something to her, or if it was just her seeing him picking up so much of her slack, but she began to sober up a little and made more of an effort to be a mother to me than she had with him. It was too late for her to repair much of her relationship with Shane, but I began not to dread the time 
that I had to spend alone with her. After he graduated, Shane went to work full time as a mechanic in the shop and started making decent money. With his grades, he could have gone to college, moved away and studied something interesting, made something of himself, but it wasn't even a thought in his mind. His dream was for me to go to college, for me to grow up and do something important. All he wanted to do was save up enough money that he could buy us all a small place out in the suburbs and put me through school. So, he continued to work his ass off and mom picked up more hours too. They both put money away each month into our future fund and I ended up having a largely normal childhood while we counted down the days until we could get out of our crappy apartment. We didn't have much, but we had each other, and that was enough. And just when it looked like we were finally going to be able to make it happen, something terrible happened. When I was 14, Shane got arrested. He was always looking for opportunities to make extra cash, to help us save up faster and start a new life, and his boss, Mr. Franks, would give him side work sometimes. Mostly, this involved him driving one of the cars from the shop and dropping off or picking up a package here or there. He never knew what was in these packages, nor did he care to ask, but he was always well compensated for his efforts. Then, one night, Mr. Franks told him that he had a slightly different assignment. Shane was to drive an associate of Mr. Franks to a house, drop him off, wait for him to come back out, and then take him right back to where he picked him up originally. That was all the information Shane had, but it seemed like a simple enough task, and he would be making double his normal fee for doing it. So, he agreed. Things went alright for the first half of the evening. Shane picked up Mr. Franks' friend at the address Mr. Franks supplied, and the man gave him directions on where to go. They didn't speak beyond him grunting, Go left here, right here, take the next exit, at Shane every so often, and they never exchanged names. It was a little over an hour before he directed Shane to kill the headlights and pull into the driveway of a home well outside the city. The man gave him strict instructions to stay inside the vehicle and leave the engine running in case they needed to make a quick getaway before exiting and slinking nimbly towards the house. At this point, Shane was apprehensive. He debated simply leaving the man behind and driving back to the city. Yet, he knew the money was going to be enough to put us over the edge and we'd finally be able to get our house. So, he sat quietly and waited, telling himself that the man was just breaking in to steal something or maybe take some compromising photos of someone. But, with the windows down, Shane heard something that made his stomach drop. Several quick pops came from inside the house and Shane looked up to see flashes of light in the upstairs window corresponding with them gunshots. Shane panicked. He threw on the headlights and tried to turn the car around as quickly as he could. No amount of money was worth him getting involved in whatever he was currently involved in, and he was just ready to punch the accelerator and fly out the driveway when a loud bang on the passenger door made him jump. The man was wrenching the door open forcefully and dove into the seat, screaming at Shane to drive and get us the hell out of here. Seeing no other options, Shane obliged and whipped back out on the road while the man kept yelling expletives. Shane realized that he was in severe pain, and when they passed under a street lamp, he saw that the man was clutching his stomach and his hands were covered in blood. Damn it, asshole shot me. Damn it, I'm losing a lot of blood. I'm not feeling too good. His voice was faltering with each word he spoke and he suddenly slumped over against the window. Shane tried to shake him, told him to wake up, but he got no response. 
Not knowing what to do, he searched for the nearest hospital on his phone and followed the directions to it. He parked on the curb near the emergency entrance and dragged the man inside announcing loudly that he'd been shot and needed help. Several doctors and nurses helped load the man onto a gurney and wheeled him away into surgery while they started asking Shane questions about him. What's his name? How old is he? How was he shot? Shane couldn't give them any answers. He was in somewhat of a state of shock and his mind wasn't processing information quickly enough. He couldn't think of a believable reason on the spot for why he had a man that had been shot in his vehicle and simply opted to tell them that he didn't know and asked if he could leave. They told him that because he'd brought in a gunshot victim, he'd have to wait to speak with the police and handed him off to hospital security. While he waited for the officers to arrive, he thought of calling Mr. Franks, but he couldn't get away from security to have a private conversation, so he just sat quietly and tried to think of a good story. What he came up with was that he'd been driving nearby when the man flagged him down at an intersection and Shane had simply pulled over to help, only to realize that the man was gravely injured. It might have been flimsy, but he didn't think they'd have any way to prove otherwise and just hoped he'd have a chance to speak to the man before the cops did so they could cooperate each other. However, it didn't matter much what excuse Shane came up with as he was arrested as soon as the officers arrived before he could even give his weak fabrication. It turned out the house Shane and the man had gone to belonged to a detective, had been investigating Mr. Franks for drug smuggling. Shane had unknowingly driven the man to an execution, and the execution had gone horribly wrong. The detective heard their car pull into his driveway and was armed and waiting when the man broke into his bedroom. They'd exchanged several shots with one another, and the detective had been fatally hit in the head while his wife took a round to the chest. The executioner must have thought she was dead, or was so flustered at having been shot himself that he didn't make sure she was gone before leaving the house. She'd been able to call 911 and explain what happened before expiring herself. Given she told them that her husband managed to shoot their attacker, the police had been put on high alert for any gunshot wounds arriving at local hospitals and when they relayed this information to Shane as they arrested him, he broke down and confessed to the whole thing. Unfortunately for Shane, the executioner didn't make it. Shane tried to explain to the officers that he had no idea what was going to happen when they drove to the house, but they wouldn't hear any of it. Mr. Franks was arrested too, but he of course had an alibi for the night and they couldn't find any evidence to tie him to hiring the man. What's worse, Mr. Franks tried to pin the whole thing on Shane. As Mr. Franks explained it to the police, he had complained to his employee that the deceased detective had been annoying him and making his business difficult. He had no idea that Shane would try to kill him over it. The evidence showed that Shane had been driving the car and there was nothing forensically to tie him to actually being in the house or having pulled the trigger, so they charged him with accessory to murder. With his word against Mr. Franks and no hard evidence either way, they didn't believe they could prove that Shane had indeed planned the whole thing, but they could definitely prove that he helped the murderer kill a detective and his wife in cold blood. They threw the book at him. We spent all the money that we had on his defense, even though he tried to tell us not to. But no matter how much we worked to argue that Shane hadn't a clue what he was doing that night, we couldn't prove it, and the court wanted to see justice for such a heinous crime. He was given a sentence of 30 years to life and hauled off to the state penitentiary with us barely having time to say goodbye. For the next 10 years, I visited him as often as possible, and he called me whenever they'd let him. 
Mum and I had ended up destitute again after the trial, and our hopes of moving on to better things were dashed. She fell back into her old ways, and I was left with the burden of trying to keep us both afloat. Worse than she was before, she wasn't able to hold down steady work, and I had to take on several jobs to pay our bills. No matter her faults, she was still my mother, and she had been good to me for years. I couldn't leave her to die in squalor. Mine and Shane's dreams of me going to college once I graduated high school evaporated. Yet Shane remained optimistic. It's one thing that never ceased to amaze me about him. All those years he spent grinding when I was younger, all throughout his trial, and even throughout his time in prison, he always kept a positive outlook, always wore a smile. Better times were just around the corner in his mind, and he continued to encourage me in every one of our conversations that we'd figure it all out someday. But I knew he was having a hard time with his sentence. He wanted desperately to get out to help me and mom, and his living conditions were awful. He tried his best to hide it, but he looked sickly whenever I saw him, and often bore the marks of having been in fights. The little food that he did receive made him ill, and he mentioned that he sometimes had to sleep on the floor if they ran out of bunks. My brother had just been trying to make us a little extra money to improve our lives, and now he was suffering for it, and maybe would be for the rest of his life. Then, a few months ago, he called me, and was far more excited to talk than usual. He told me he'd been selected as a potential candidate for the prison's new early release program. At the time, he had 20 years left before he'd be eligible for parole, but if he agreed to participate, they'd set him free right away. As it was a new process, there'd be some additional oversight on his time outside, and if things weren't going well, he could still be brought back in. But it was a chance. That sounds way too good to be true, I said. What's the catch? Well, they said I'd have to undergo an experimental procedure. Called it being ethically altered. Cutting edge science, they say though. Apparently, it removes your criminal tendencies or something and can guarantee that you'll never commit another crime. But the beauty is, I haven't really got any criminal tendencies in the first place, so it shouldn't do anything to me. He was speaking so quickly, I barely caught it all. I was hesitant. I don't know, Shane. I don't like the idea of you being used like some kind of lab rat. And what do you mean, ethically altered? That sounds... I don't know. Is it like a surgery they want to do in your brain? Yeah, I know it sounds a little... off. But it's just the term the prison probably came up with to make it sound nice for the people outside. Anyway... They said no surgery, no drugs. They won't tell me exactly what the process is. Guess it's top secret stuff, but apparently there's nothing physically invasive about it. My guess is they're going to strap me into a chair or something and put a helmet on me that'll pulse some kind of waves through my brain and try to rewrite it to be more docile. The thinking that he might undergo a procedure that would potentially alter his brain he was sounding remarkably nonchalant. Dude, that sounds super sketchy. If they won't tell you what exactly they're going to do to you, what if it messes up your brain? What if it kills you? I was growing less convinced that the idea was good with every word. It won't kill me. They gave me a guarantee of that. Yes, they said it would change me, but, but like I said, they were talking about removing my criminal tendencies you know that I'm not really a serious criminal or anything. Look, this is an opportunity for us, Jack. Ten minutes. That's how long they said the whole process takes. Ten minutes, and I'm back with you and mom. Ten minutes, and we can get our lives back on track. I can get a job, and we can save up money again. 
You'll go to college. It'll be just like we planned. Mom will probably even get out of a downward spiral and start helping out again. His last few sentences made me realize that he hadn't been calling to ask for my opinion on his participation in the program. You've already signed up, haven't you? I asked him. I... He paused. I love you, little brother. The line went dead. I didn't hear from him again after that. He normally called once every few days, but the phone didn't ring for a week. When I got a day off work, I drove up to the prison to see him in person, but I was told that I couldn't. He was apparently sick and in the infirmary. I told them that he'd been talking about participating in the new early release program and asked if his illness was related to that. They told me that he just had the flu. However, they also said that there was no new early release program that they are aware of. Leaving them with a message to have him call me as soon as he was feeling better, I went home with a pit in my stomach. Something was wrong. In all the years he'd been inside, Shane and I had never gone this long without speaking. Sure, he'd gotten very sick a few times, but he always called before heading to the infirmary to let me know he might be out of touch for a little while. And why hadn't they known about the early release program? Were they lying? Did something go wrong with the process and they were trying to cover it up? Or had it really been so top secret that not everyone in the prison was privy to the information? In any case, I knew all I could do for the time was wait. Another week passed without a call, and I made another trip to the prison, where I received the same story. He was still sick, and I couldn't see him. I was more forceful this time, and demanded that they let me visit him in the infirmary if he was really that ill. They told me that that would be impossible. It wasn't until they threatened to escort me out physically and not allow me back for future visits that I finally capitulated and left of my own accord. After the third week with no word from Shane, I was convinced that something terrible had happened to him and the prison was trying to hide it. I called up there so much asking for information on him or his program that they blocked my number and I was on the brink of writing directly to the government when my phone rang. It wasn't Shane. It was someone from the prison informing me that we could come pick him up the next day. He was being released on parole. That was it. I started to try to reply with questions. But they cut me off saying, You'll be available at noon before hanging up on me. I couldn't believe it. Three weeks of radio silence, and now, suddenly, he was getting let out. They were really letting him go. I was going to have my brother back. But any excitement of mine at having him returned was tempered with wondering what state he'd be in when we brought him home. They had put him away believing that he had potentially had a large part in planning the murder of an innocent man and woman, one of them being a member of law enforcement. What had they done to him that made them so convinced he was no longer a danger to society? I only needed to wait until we picked him up the following day to understand why they weren't worried about him anymore. Shane had been right about one thing. Mom was different with the prospect of him coming home. She only had half her normal morning helping of vodka and actually ironed her clothes, although her hands were shaking so badly as she did it that it didn't help much. We even had our first real conversation in years about how things were going to be okay now that he was coming back. Yet... When we saw him, we quickly realized 
that it wasn't going to be the homecoming we'd hoped for. Shane was different. The smile that he always wore was gone. In fact, all the life that normally filled his face seemed to be missing. He wore a vacant expression and stared into the distance as if he recognized nothing in front of him. When I called his name, he turned to face me, but it was as if he only did it because he recognized the word Shane and not his brother's voice. I wrapped him up in a hug and asked him if he was okay, told him how happy I was to see him and that he was free. He didn't hug me back. His arms lay stiff at his sides. Shane had always been a big hugger, especially with me, and I'd expected that on his first day of freedom. He'd give me a huge squeeze. I got nothing. Pulling back, I grew worried. Shane, what the hell? Are you okay? What did they do to you? I shook him slightly as I asked. I feel okay, he responded so mechanically that I could scarcely recognize his voice from the AI ones that I used for voiceovers. Just when I was about to begin screaming at the guards that were helping escort him to explain what was wrong with him, a thin, dark-haired woman in a lab coat approached us and introduced herself as Dr. Kosick, head of the new program. Are you Shane's brother? She asked. He listed you as his post-release guardian. Yeah, I am. What the hell did you do to him? I snapped at her. She considered me coolly. Your brother is one of the first people to undergo a revolutionary new process that is going to change the way we handle criminal justice in this country. No longer will we need to lock away the worst members of our society forever. We will be able to give them the alteration and they will be able to rejoin the rest of us. You should be proud of him, she said with an air of condescension. That's not my brother. I didn't like her superior attitude. Shane has never stood still for more than 10 seconds in my entire life. Look at him. Shane hadn't moved an inch with the guard that was escorting him stopped when we walked up. He looked over towards me and Dr. Kosick whenever he heard the word Shane, but then, realizing we weren't speaking directly to him, turned his head straight forward again and stared blankly into space. You need to lower your voice. She bore an expression of annoyance. I understand that the effects of the process may be shocking at first, but you'll see in time that he's better off this way. You have to remember that your brother committed a heinous crime and likely would have done something similar in the future had we let him out via the normal practice. In any case, the effects cannot be reversed. What we need to discuss now is the path forward. Screw you, lady. I was seething. You don't know anything about him. He was innocent. He was a good man. And what do you mean the effects can't be reversed? You change him back. Change him back right now. I don't care if he sits in here for the rest of his life. At least he'll be himself. She was starting to mark some things off on a clipboard, and I could tell was only half listening to me. Looking up, she began... Again, the process is irreversible, and you will find that your brother signed a binding agreement to participate in this trial. He's been evaluated over the last several weeks by medical staff and government officials, and everyone is on board with moving forward with phase two, public reintroduction. At this point, you have two options. Option one, you can sign this, and you'll get to take your brother home. For the first month, you will call me daily to discuss how he's doing, and we will make periodic home visits to inspect in person. We'll help him get work so he can start contributing to society again like a law-abiding citizen. You will not disclose anything about this process to anyone, and if anyone should ask how he got out early or why he's acting so differently, 
you'll say that he's been reformed and he was released early due to good behavior and overcrowding. Any violation of these terms and he will be brought right back here and you will lose all future visitation privileges. Option 2. You don't sign this and we take your brother back inside right now and you'll lose all future visitation privileges. And before you start spouting off legality or suing us or anything of that nature. She could obviously see the fury in my eyes. You should know that we have the backing from the highest levels. Your case would go nowhere. Now, if you could hurry up and make your decision please. I have several more of these to do today. She returned to a clipboard. I was shaking with anger, clearly to her. Shane was nothing more than a variable in her experiment. He wasn't a person, a brother, a friend, a human at all. Just a note on a clipboard, an alteration for her to study. But what choice did I have? She had all the power, and she knew it. If I fought her or refused, she'd take Shane away and I'd never see him again. And if he'd been living poorly before, it would be nothing to how I imagined him living inside now, sitting on his bed day in and day out, wasting away with that blank stare on his face. Wrenching the clipboard from her hands, I signed the agreement. We rode home in near silence. Both mom and I tried to ask Shane questions about the process he underwent, but all he could tell us was, I don't remember. I was just about to ask him what he did remember, to see if he even really knew who we were, when he abruptly announced, I'm tired, I need to sleep. Again, his voice had no emotion behind it. It sounded as if a computer was reading off lines from code. Wondering now if they turned him into some sort of cyborg, I looked in the rear view, half expecting to see red eyes staring back at me. But I was surprised to find he'd already fallen asleep. Instantly, as soon as he'd said it, he went to sleep. Like it was the next line in a command string. I made a plan to go over his entire body with a metal detecting wand that I had at home from one of my security chops as soon as we got through the door. When we arrived at the apartment complex and parked the car, he was still snoring. I had to open the back door and shake him slightly to wake him. In the past, when I'd woken him from a deep slumber, he'd always been a little grumpy. It was the only time I was cautious around him. On instinct, I stood slightly back as he opened his eyes, awaiting a tirade of frustration and asking for five more minutes. But he just stared straight ahead again. Shane? I said his name. He turned to look at me, but didn't reply. Hey, we're home. You can get out of the car now and we can go inside. I wondered how much of his behavior was due to the alteration, or how much might be due to him having been in prison for 10 years and always having to be told what to do. Okay. His vocal cords made the sound, but it's hard to describe. It wasn't his voice. I know that doesn't make much sense, but I've heard that voice for 24 years. I know the quality the cadence, the inflection. It just wasn't his. Mom had already given up. She started crying in the drive home, and the minute we parked, she'd run upstairs. I knew to go hit the bottle, or maybe something stronger. Shane exited the car, and I closed the door behind him. Surprisingly, he started walking towards the elevators, like he knew where he was going. I decided not to say anything and see if he remembered where he lived. He hit the up button as he should have and selected the correct floor once he was inside. When we exited on our floor, he made a direct line for our unit. 
I followed him closely and watched as he opened the door, just as he'd done hundreds of times before. However, he stopped right after stepping through the threshold and stood stock still again. I nearly crashed into him. He seemed to be waiting on the next set of instructions, so I told him to go sit at the kitchen table for now. Okay, the voice came again. Just as I'd planned to do on the drive back, I ran my wand over his body and found he had no metal inside of him. I felt his head for signs of stitching or scarring and discovered nothing. I checked every inch of exposed skin for surgical markings, but at least to my untrained eye, he was clean. The entire time I did my examination, Shane didn't move, nor did his expression change. That blank stare just fixated on the wall in front of him, and I got the impression I could do nearly anything to him and he wouldn't respond. I sat down at the table across from him and started asking the questions that I'd wanted to ask in the car. Hey Shane? His eyes met mine, and it was only then that we were sitting down and I was looking directly into them that I truly saw that there was nothing behind them. Whatever it was that made Shane Shane was gone. I was looking only at a collection of cells, a biological mass that could walk and talk but had no personality, had no life. It terrified me. My voice quivered as I asked, Shane, do you, do you remember your full name? Yes. What is it? Shane Theodore Thompson. It was like he was recalling a date stored away in a hard drive. Do you know who I am? Yes. Who am I to you? And what is my full name? You are my brother, Jack Francis Thompson. How old are we? I am 36 and you are 24. I was happy to see that he at least knew who he was and who I was. But this was all information they could have had him memorize at the prison. I wanted to ask something more personal to see if he really had all of Shane's memories. Who did you lose your virginity to and where did it happen? Elise Sherman and in a parent's basement. Now this story was one that Shane and I laughed about often. Elise's father had come downstairs while they were in the middle of the deed and he chased Shane out of the house with Shane's pants around his ankles. It had woken the neighbours and several of them got an eyeful of Shane's business while he desperately tried to pull his pants up and dive back into his car. But this time, he relayed the information with no humour, no crack of a smile remembering the absurdity of it all. The information was there, in his head, but it was as if he had no connection to it. I realised that they hadn't removed his criminal tendencies as they told him they were going to do. They'd removed him. I don't know how they did it, and at the time, I still wasn't sure what they'd done, but I knew that he wasn't there anymore. Shane's body was sitting right in front of me, but my brother had died somewhere in that prison. Over the next several weeks, I kept my agreement with Dr. Kosick. I called her daily and informed her of how things were progressing with Shane. There weren't really any changes to report. As she stated they would, they helped him secure a job at a local grocery store and she checked in on him in person twice. She couldn't have been more delighted with the success of her program. If you could really call it that, I surely didn't. Yes, Shane hadn't committed any crimes and seemed highly unlikely to ever do so, but Shane also hadn't done much of anything. He was operating on what I would have called pure animal instinct, outside of being given direct instructions. When he was hungry, he ate. 
thirsty, he drank. When he needed to use the restroom or sleep, he did that as well. But beyond that, I had to tell him to do anything. Shower, brush his teeth, get dressed, go to work. At the grocery store, he had to be given specific tasks by his boss, and he was able to perform them perfectly. But he took no initiative beyond doing exactly what he was told to do. And that's what it seemed our lives would be from then on. Shane had given so much of his life for me, sacrificed his entire future. I didn't mind helping him for once, and decided that I would continue to support him in this state until the day that one of us died. But then, last week, something changed. Shane and I share a bedroom, and I awoke around 3am to an odd scratching sound. We are no strangers to rats on our building, but this was different. It was coming from near Shane's bed. I walked over to investigate, using my cell phone light to check for vermin. I couldn't find anything. And, as I approached, the noise simply stopped. Too tired to care much, I went back to sleep with plans to look into it in the morning. Yet in the morning, those plans were driven straight out of my mind. It was the smell of bacon that woke me the second time and I opened my eyes in confusion. Mom hadn't gotten up to make breakfast in years, and Shane hadn't cooked anything since his return. He just ate pre-made meals or leftovers from the fridge. Rolling over, I saw that Shane's bed was empty, and I sat up quickly in astonishment. I'd had to tell him to get out of bed every morning since he came back. What was going on? Then... I heard it. Laughter. Shane's laughter drifted through the doorway. Him and mom were having an animated conversation in the kitchen. I heard my name through the cackles. Leary eyed, I walked in to join them and saw that Shane was at the stove, happily frying up breakfast, while mom was at the table, smiling and having a cigarette. Speak of the devil, mom said and Shane spun around. He ran over to me, spatula still in hand, and wrapped me in a massive hug. Stunned, I only feebly returned it as he said, Good morning, little brother. So glad you're awake. We were just talking about the time you tried to make me a birthday cake, and you mix up the salt and the sugar. He started laughing hard and pulled back. I was at a loss for words. He was acting just like his old self. Was I dreaming? As he tried to step back towards the stove, I grabbed his face with both my hands and looked directly into his eyes. There was life there again. But still, there was something off about them. A darkness I didn't remember from before. There was a sudden flash of black and I leapt back, gasping. What's the matter, Jack? Still shocked about how much better looking I am than you? He laughed some more and went back to his cooking. It was a trick of the light, I told myself. Just be happy, he's acting like himself again. Maybe after a few weeks the effects lessen or something. But I couldn't shake the feeling that there was a coldness in Shane's laughter that hadn't been there before. Whatever my reservations... We had the best family breakfast we'd had since Shane was put away. We reminisced about old times, talked about our future. I nearly cried at how happy I was to have my brother truly returned. After he left for work, I called Dr. Cossack to give my update, and I debated whether to tell her the truth. Shane's behavioral change was positive in my view, but she might not see it the same way. Maybe she'd want to take him back and do the process over again. But the first words out of her mouth when she picked up were, Is he acting differently today? She sounded anxious. Her tone made me nervous. 
maybe something had gone wrong with some of the other participants. Um, yeah, yeah, he was acting like his old self this morning. He even got up and made breakfast, I replied. Did you notice anything strange about him? How did she know? Nothing serious. I just thought there was a kind of... I don't know. His eyes looked different. What's going on? Um, I'm just... Just hang on tight. I'll come out and check in on him tomorrow. And she suddenly hung up. My heart was hammering. She knew something. She'd been expecting exactly what I told her. I tried to call her back, but he went straight to voicemail. For the rest of the day, I tried to act as normally as possible, just as she'd instructed. I went to work myself, but had a hard time concentrating. I wondered how Shane would be that evening. But when he returned from his shift, he did so with a bag full of groceries in his arms and announced loudly that he was going to make us a five-star meal. Seeing his smiling face pushed my concerns down, and I chalked Dr. Kosick's behavior up to her process possibly failing. Maybe whatever she'd done had reversed itself, and she was not, in fact, going to revolutionize criminal justice in this country. With that thought, I wondered if this might be the last night I have with my brother before they hauled him back to prison to do more tests or simply lock him away again. I decided, if that was the case, that I should stop my worrying and just enjoy the evening with my family. We ate, we drank, we laughed, we sang. It was a perfect night. Until we fell asleep. I awoke again around 3 a.m. The scratching had returned, louder this time, and I looked over towards Shane's bed. Damn, my whisper yelled as I sat up and slid back towards the wall. Shane was sitting bolt upright in his bed with his feet down on the floor. He was glaring at me. There was a malevolent grin on his face illuminated by the digital clock on his nightstand. The hell are you doing, man? I yelped. There was something about his presence. It was dark and heavy. It made the air around me oppressive, and I was struggling to get full breaths in. He didn't reply. Just kept watching me. His eyes were cold, and as I stared into them, I caught movement behind him. A shadow was crawling across his wall. A shadow with red eyes and long, spindly fingers. He opened his mouth, and a voice... Voices? That I did not recognize emanated from it. Shh. Go back to sleep, little brother. There was no love behind the words. It was malice. It was evil. My eyelids sagged and I collapsed back onto the bed. I tried to fight it, but exhaustion overcame me and I fell back into a deep sleep. The next day, I didn't wake up until noon. Shane had already left for work and I had six missed calls and a flurry of texts from my manager asking why I hadn't shown up for my shift. I played the events of the night before back in my mind and tried to tell myself it was a dream, but there was no way it could be real. But when I looked over at Shane's bed, I saw there were deep gouges in the wall behind it, gouges that looked like they'd been made by massive, clawed hands. Something clicked into place. I formed a theory on what they'd done to Shane at the prison. I think they removed his soul. I don't know how they did it. I don't know if it was magic or if it was science. But I think the soul that had inhabited Shane's body, the very thing that made him who he was, 
had been ripped out. Dr. Kosick never showed up for a visit, and she stopped answering my calls. When I contacted the prison directly, they said that Dr. Kosick had never worked there and told me there was no record of a Shane Theodore Thompson even serving time at the facility. They've abandoned us. They're trying to cover this up. He's getting worse by the day. He can move things without touching them. I've heard him speak in languages I can't understand. I'm sure this is happening to more of them that went through the process. To more of them that they ethically altered. Because I don't think they considered that if they removed the souls that inhabited these people, they left them open to be inhabited by something else. <laughs>